<laughs> now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, yeah. the breakfast cereal shot from guns, yeah. Yeah. present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on Huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Quick as a whip, plenty of snap. Yes, that's the kind of energy Sergeant Preston has. And that's the kind that calls for a good breakfast. So take a tip. Be sure every morning your breakfast includes a heaping bowlful of delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice topped with milk or cream and fruit. These tempting, crisp, king-sized kernels of wheat and rice shot from guns give you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. So, for plenty of snap, eat good breakfast, including that big treat, tasty, nutritious Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. King skidded around the corner and raced down Front Street until he reached the headquarters of the Northwest Mounted. There, he threw himself against the door, barking furiously. A second later, Sergeant Preston opened the door. King, what's the matter? Want me to follow you? All right, boy, I'll get my pocket. The sergeant slipped into his pocket and started after King. From the brilliantly lighted Front Street with its row of cafes, the dog led the way back to Fourth Street. Here, there was only an occasional light, but the sergeant could see a crowd gathered in front of one of the cabins. Hey, here comes Sergeant Preston. He'll put a stop to it. Yeah, maybe he will. Yeah. What's going on in that cabin? It's a fight, Sergeant. Yeah. They sound like they're murdering each other. Who? A young fellow named Tex Wainwright and somebody else. Tex lives here. I never saw the other guy before. All right, let me through. Let me through, please. Yeah. Two men inside the cabin were standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, slugging it out. Right. But they were arm-weary and winded. When the sergeant pulled them apart, they had no strength to resist. All right, that's enough. Which one of you is Wainwright? That's me. What's your name? Henry. Mike Henry. What's this all about? It's personal. How'd it start? There was a knock at the door. I opened it. He walked in and hit me. Just like that? Just like that. Why, Henry? Better ask him. Well, Tex? I've got nothing to say, Sergeant. It's personal. There's no sense in talking about it. You were defending yourself? That's right. You started it, Hanley? That's right. Then I'm going to lock you up. Go ahead. Now, wait. Don't, Sergeant. Can't we forget about it? You know we can't. I don't want to make any complaint. It's just between us. It's strictly our business. It's the force's business when you start disturbing the peace. Where do you live, Hanley? At the palace. I'll take you back there. You're new in town, Hanley. Must be a long-standing grudge of some sort. Yeah. Well, your past doesn't interest me, but there'll be no feuding in the Yukon Territory. That understood? Yeah. We understand. Then come along. As soon as the sergeant and Mike Hanley had left the cabin, Tex washed and put on a clean shirt. Fifteen minutes later, he walked into the Monte Carlo. Meg Forrest saw him as soon as he stepped inside the door and hurried to his side. You were in a fight. Yeah. With Mike Hanley. He's followed you here. He's here, anyway. Sergeant Preston broke it out. What did you tell the sergeant? Nothing. Tex, you should have. If the sergeant knew that Mike has sworn to kill you, he... He's sworn to do it with his fist, Meg. He can't. Now, that's all there is to it. There's nothing to worry about. Tex. Just the same, I'm going to get on with my business. You're going up to North Creek? Yeah. I'll find the old Indian Paul wrote me about just before he died. I'll get the gold Paul left with him, and then I'll come back here. 
you and I are heading for the state. What if Mike follows you up to North Creek? I'll leave tomorrow night, honey. Nobody will know I've gone. That's easy to say. Oh, I wish you told the sergeant and had him locked up. No, I couldn't. Why not? Because if I was in Mike's place, maybe I'd feel the same way. It's one thing for a jury to say you're innocent and another you for... You were innocent, Tex. You were only protecting yourself, and it wasn't your blow that killed Steve Hanley. If I hadn't hit him, he'd never have cracked his head against that rock. He started it all. All right, all right. All I said was that I understand the way Mike feels. Let's forget about it. Okay. You ready to leave? I have to sing one more song. I'll be waiting here, Meg. I'll walk you home. There was a man standing at the bar close to where Meg and Tex had been talking. He kept his head down and his shoulders hunched over his drink as he listened. His sharp black eyes were narrow to slits, his thin lips twisted in a smile. He waited for a few minutes after Meg had left Tex. Then he made his way through the crowd to one of the rooms in the back of the cafe. Inside, there were five men seated around a table playing poker. All right, break it up for a minute. What do you mean, break it up? I've just started to win a few parts. I've got news, Ace. Yeah? What about, Blakey? Tex Wainwright and that gold cash his father left him. Come on, let's get back to the game. Oh, I want to hear. Go on, Blackie. Now, let's see. He stayed around here for a month courting Meg. But he starts for North Creek tomorrow night. Do we follow him or don't we? I'm for it. Yes, what idea. makes you think uh, we can get away with it? Well, there's six of us. Well, he knows us. We'd have to kill him. Well? I don't like that. Neither do I. If we left town right after him, we'd be suspected first thing. But we wouldn't, Ace. That's why my news is good news. There's a man in town called Mike Hanley from Texas, and he's sworn to kill Tex. How do you know that? I've just been listening to Meg and Tex talking over. It seems Hanley and Tex had a big fight tonight. Sergeant Preston stopped it. But why does this uh, Hanley want to kill him? Well, from what I could gather, Tex had a fight with another Hanley back in Texas. Steve, his name was. And Steve died as a result of it. Maybe he was Mike's brother, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Wasn't Tex accused of murder? Oh, well, the jury turned them loose. Self-defense. So what about it? But think, Ace. Tex leaves town. We make sure Mike knows about it. He follows Tex. And we follow Mike. If Mike doesn't finish Tex off, we do. But Mike gets blamed for it, you see? Meg will see to that. She'll tell the Northwest Mounted about the feud. Right? Yeah. That sounds pretty good, Blackie. <laughs> yeah. How about the rest of you? Like it? I like I think it, it might work. Okay. We'll need three sleds and supplies, Ace. I'll take care of them. I'll see that Hanley's tipped off about Tex leaving town. Well, get on with your game, gents. You'll be playing for bigger stakes tomorrow night. <laughs> That's right. Yes, <laughs> Blackie informed Mike Hanley of Tex's plans the next morning. That night, Mike Hanley stood at the window of his room in the Palace Hotel. It was after 12 o'clock when he saw Tex Wainwright leave the Monte Carlo. Half an hour later, he was driving up the Klondike, following the fresh tracks of Tex's sled. And half an hour after that, three other sleds left Dawson. Blackie, Ace, and company were on the trail of gold. So far, so good, Ace. You can make this team move faster. No need for it. Give Tex a chance to find his gold. Give Mike a chance to get rid of him for it. Why should we hurry? Better to be too early than too late. Give him the whip. Well, okay. March! March! But what Blackie and Ace could not know was that Meg's concern made her inquire for Mike Hanley at the Palace Hotel the following morning. When she learned that he had left town by dog sled shortly after Tex the previous night, she went straight to the Northwest Mounted headquarters and told Sergeant Preston the whole story of the feud between the two men. Mike is bigger than Tex, much stronger. And up there at North Creek with no one to stop him, I know he'll go through with it. He'll kill him. When did Tex leave? A little after midnight. You have a good team? Yes. Mm. And he intended to make the trip as fast as he could. I don't think Mike can catch him before he gets to the creek, but that will be tonight sometime or late this you afternoon. You spoke of an Indian. Tom Kasaya. Hmm. He lives near the head of the creek. Tex has a letter with his mark on it. It's to identify him. I understand all that. You'll go after them. Of course. Is there any chance Not that... of overtaking them before they get to the creek. But King can make the trip faster than any other lead dog in the Yukon. We may arrive in time to prevent trouble. In time to save Tex's life, Sergeant. Oh, King, please. We'll do our best. Come on, boy. We're hitting the trail. 
In less than 15 minutes, the sergeant's team was harnessed. And because the trails were hard packed at that time of year, King, who usually worked as a loose lead, was also harnessed. This was enough to make the great dog realize the need for speed. He looked back at his master as he took his place behind the sled. The welcome words came. On King! On your huskies! And King leaped forward, determined to make the sergeant proud of him, calling on the rest of the team to match his effort. Long way, boy. We've got to make time. On, King! We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Fellas and girls, time marches back. It's the scene of a famous race, the race between the hare and the tortoise. The crowds are in a frenzy of excitement, and so are the hare and the tortoise. They're down at the starting line, talking excitedly. Hey, yeah, uh, Tortie, old boy, did you hear about the wonderful prize for the winner? Yes, indeed. A whole year's supply of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The famous breakfast seal shot from gun. Oh, yo boy, oh boy, how I'd go for giant sized, crisp, delicious Quaker puffed wheat of rice every single morning. And now, the hare and the tortoise are on their mark. They're ready, set, and off they go. Just watch that hare tear. Hey, gee, I can see myself now every morning pouring out a heaping bowl full of Quaker puffed wheat of rice. And covering it with lots of rich milk or cream and some sweet chilled fruit. Ah, I can just taste those luscious mouth water and spoonfuls. We can't see the hare anymore. The tortoise has barely started, but he's plodding along steadily. Oh, my. I'd give anything to win that prize and have Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice every morning. They taste so good. And I hear they're mighty good for you, too give you extra food values of restored natural green amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Believe me, that's... We're at the finish line now. The race is almost over, and at the tortoise wins! <laughs> and the prize, fellas and girls, is one you can have, too. Just race to the breakfast table every morning for Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. You'll love that scrumptious, nut-like flavor and tender crispness that just melts in your mouth. Yes, for a treat that can't be beat, make your cereals Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. The famous cereals shot from guns. Now to continue. Tex Wainwright reached Tom Kusaya's cabin on North Creek at 8 o'clock that evening. He showed the old Indian the last letter he'd received from his father with Tom's mark below the elder Wainwright's signature. Uh, Tom not need this letter to know you're right, fella. Your face hit like Tom's friend. Yeah. Everybody says I look like my father. Uh, those not your dogs. Tom put them in run side of cabin. Somebody come. Do you have many visitors? No. You first man Tom see in month. I wonder if... Tom, find out who come. Huh? Evening. I'm looking for Tex Wainwright. Oh, I see I've come to the right place. This friend of yours, Tex? I couldn't very well call him a friend. Mind if I come in, Injun? What you say, Tex? Yeah, let him in. It's come a long way. It's a good place to settle our business. Won't be any mounted police around to interfere. I suppose we might as well settle it. Sooner or later, I've got to make you realize that you can't do what you've sworn to do. But there's no hurry. You must be hungry. I am. Let's have something to eat before we start. As long as it's Indian's food, that suits me. Uh, you can feed another traveler, can't you, Tom? Yeah, they have plenty of food. You sit down. Come, put them on table. It was a strange meal. Tex talked with Tom about his father, but Mike said nothing. Finally, Tex rose from the table. Well, I... I guess we'd better take off our gun belts and our coats and leave them in here. In here? Oh, yeah. 
Let's go outside. No sense in wrecking Tom's cabin. That suits me. What you do, Tex? We've got a little matter to settle with our fist, Tom. You stay in here. After it's over... After I'll... it's over, you can bury him. What, that? <laughs> That's a joke, Tom. After it's over, we'll patch him up and send him on his way. Ready, Mike? Yeah. Without another word, the two men left the cabin. It was nearly as bright as day outside. There was a moon and a northern light streaked across the sky. The tall pines at the edge of the forest and back of the cabin cast great black shadows across the snow. The two men squared off. Mike struck out with a right. Tex parried the blow. The Huskies began to bark. For a few minutes, both Mike and Tex were content to feel each other out. Then Tex stung Mike with a left, and they threw caution to the winds. For the next five minutes, they fought savagely. They didn't see the dog team stop down the trail. They didn't see the men advancing toward them along the banks of the creek. It was Tom, watching from the doorway of the cabin, who shouted out a warning. Hey! Those fellas have guns! A shot rang out and Tex pitched against Mike. Surprised, Mike caught him in his arms. Hey, bring him inside. Well, what happened? Those killer down trail crooks. Acting by instinct, Mike started for the cabin supporting Tex. Tom opened fire on the man who took cover below the bank of the creek. Hurry, inside. Yeah. Put him on cot and blow out the lamp. Steady does it, Tex. Yeah. Now, lie down here. Tex, oh. you see fella shoot you? Yeah, I recognize one of them. An hombre called Blackie. Blackie? No good, coyotes. They're after the gold, Tom. Them not get it. Where you here, Tex? In the side. I'll see what I can do to fix you up. You better get out of here, Mike. Why? It's no concern of yours. Maybe they've finished the job for you. I've finished my own job. That good idea. You leave. Why, I can shoot. Tex, not able to shoot. There's six men out there. You go out back way, in the forest. Not let Crook see you. Go to Roadhouse, near Mouth of Creek. Bring men back. Can you hold them off all by yourself? Uh, Tom, do that. You come, me show way. Unting! Un, you husky! Sergeant Preston had made a record run to North Creek. He had stopped for a moment at the roadhouse near the mouth of the creek, and the proprietor had told him of the unusual traffic past his place that evening. Not two sleds, but five had headed up the creek. Now King was following the broken trail at a ground-devouring pace. He rounded a bend and saw a man running toward him. Oh, King! Hi, Rusty! Hello! Hello! King, it's Mike Hanley. Sergeant Preston, I, I never... I never thought I'd be glad to see you again. What's the matter? There's a bunch of crooks. Tex has been wounded. Huh? He and the engine at the cabin. Crook's got him holed up. Look, you better hurry. How far is the cabin? It's the top of the creek. Maybe three miles I ran all the way. I'm winded. Get on the sled. Right. All right. I'm King! I'm King stepped up his pace, and the sergeant jumped on the running board. When Mike was able to breathe more easily, he questioned him further. Who are the men who attacked the cabin? Any idea? I recognize one of them, name of Black. Oh? Huh? That explains a lot. Been too much talk about the Wainwright gold. How many men are there altogether? The engine said there were six. I don't know how much ammunition they have in the cabin. I've been gone over half an hour. We'll be back there in less than that, though. How's it happen you're so anxious to help, Tex? Those sidewinders shot him in the back. And you'll want to kill him yourself, is that it? No, not anymore. What's happened? I don't know. But Tex is a game guy. And then there was something he said in the cabin. He wanted me to clear out. That Blackie and his gang were after his gold. It was no concern of mine. And then all of a sudden, I realized something. What? He held no grudge against me in spite of the fact that I'd been giving him a hard time. All of a sudden, I realized that he was as sorry as I was about what had happened to my brother Steve. But hey, how'd you find out that I wanted to kill Tex? That doesn't matter as long as you don't. As King began to bark, the sergeant looked ahead. A red glow was staining the sky. Fire! Yes. Anywhere near the cabin? Could be. Anywhere they could set it afire? Blackie and his gang? There were no windows in the back. Sure. If they cut through the woods, they could have got close enough. Tex and the engine wouldn't have a chance if they had to leave the cabin. Unking! Fifteen minutes later, they stopped in front of the burning cabin. Unking! They were greeted by a chorus of barking dogs, but there was no sign of a human being around. Gone. 
All of them. Easy, boy. What are you doing? Unharnessing King. They've left their dogs and their sleds, and if they've gone into the forest, King can help us track them down. Not that we'll need his help. No? Look, footprints. We can follow them. Come on, boy. What do you suppose happened? Well, the cabin on fire, Tex and Tom Kosaya had to come out and surrender. Perhaps they were shot as they came through the door. There's no sign of that. No, Blackie wants Texas gold, and Tom's the only one who knows where it's cached. They're forcing him to show him where it is, the point of a gun. If he does, that'll be the end of both Tom and Tex. The tracks of the men led deeper and deeper into the forest. King whined impatiently, and the sergeant laid a restraining hand on his harness. Easy, King. Hold it a second. What's the matter? They went straight on. The sergeant was studying the sky through an opening in the trees. No, not straight, Mike. We haven't been traveling in a straight line. It seemed that way to me. I hope it seemed that way to Blackie and the others. Right now, we're heading south. South? That's towards the mouth of the creek. Yes, Tom isn't leading them to any cache. He's heading straight for the roadhouse. And when he gets close enough, he'll call for help. Come on. The sergeant broke into a run. King ran easily at his side, and Mike followed as closely as he could. Five minutes, ten minutes. Then they heard voices ahead of them. Listen. can't go any further. Good. What's good about it? Two of us, six of them. You wait here, Mike. I'm going to cut over to the left and circle around in front of them. Give me five minutes and then start shooting. What? I can't see them. Just shoot in their general direction. In five minutes. <laughs> Quiet, boy. Let's go. Silently, the sergeant and King slipped forward from tree to tree. A few minutes later, they saw the outlaws and their prisoners sprawl on the ground in a small clearing. The sergeant worked his way around to the far side of the clearing moving with infinite care. Now he was only a few feet away from Tex and the Indian. Mike began to shoot. The outlaws jumped to their feet and ran to the opposite side of the clearing from where the sergeant was standing. He called to Tex. Tex, Tom, quick, come here. Tex saw the sergeant and recognized him. Sergeant Preston, come on, Tom. Two men jumped to their feet and ran toward the sergeant. He saw them. Hey, they're making a break for it. But before he could shoot, the sergeant fired and Ace clutched his right arm. With Tex and Tom safely behind him, the sergeant stepped into the clearing. Put up your hands. You're under arrest in the name of the queen. The outlaws knew the sergeant. Not one of them had the nerve to exchange shots with him, and they dropped their guns to the ground. But Blackie, shielded by the others and closest to the trees, made a break for it. That's Blackie getting away, sergeant. He's the ringleader. I'll get him. Grab those guns, Tom. Keep them covered. Tom, do that. And make one move. Shoot. Come on, King. <laughs> Blackie had a lead of 50 yards on the sergeant and was out of sight when he and King plunged into the forest. But his trail was easily followed. And when the sergeant finally saw him, running as fast as he could, he let go of King's harness with a word of command. Stop him, boy. The great dog leaped ahead, but except for a low growl, as silent as a shadow. The glint of metal in Blackie's hand told him he was carrying a gun. And when King had closed the distance between them, he dove for Blackie's feet and tripped him up. <laughs> Blackie fell face down in the snow and his gun shot out of his hand. The sergeant closed in. All right, King, I've got him covered. You would never have caught me if it hadn't been for that dog. Get up. I can't. I think my leg's broken. I doubt that. Stand back, King. I'll handle him, boy. The sergeant holstered his gun and bent over to help Blackie to his feet. There was nothing wrong with the man. As Blackie stood up, he whipped a knife from inside his pocket and struck. But the sergeant caught his wrist, and the blade stopped an inch from his chest. Blackie lashed at him with his left, and the sergeant went down with Blackie on top of him, still trying to drive his knife home. King barked his concern, but his master had told him to stand back. The sergeant called in all his strength, and inch by inch, he forced the knife back. Then a quick twist, and the shining blade shot into the undergrowth. Blackie wasn't finished. He leaped to his feet and aimed a vicious kick at the sergeant's face. The sergeant rolled aside just in time, and King could restrain himself no longer. He threw himself at Blackie and knocked him back from the sergeant. The sergeant jumped to his feet. Bye, King. I'll take care of him. Blackie charged. The sergeant took a right and a left to the jaw and then, shaking off their numbing effects, charged himself and battered down Blackie's defense. A right and a left, then a right again, a left to the body, and then a final right to the jaw. Blackie's head shot back and he dropped to the ground. Mike came running through the forest toward the sergeant. Sergeant, are you all right? Yes, Mike. Give me a hand with him. Right. Mike helped the sergeant carry Blackie back to the clearing and then the other members of the gang were ordered to build a campfire. By its light, the sergeant put a new dressing on Tex's wound and took care of Ace's arm. There. That will do until we get you back to Dawson. How are you feeling, Tex? All right, Mike. I'll be ready for our next bout in a week or so. Huh. What does that mean? Nothing. 
Just changed my mind about a few things. Such as what? Well, of course, I had nothing to do with saving your life. King got the sergeant here in time to do that. I just came along for the ride, but... Well, I was in on it in a way. You sure were. You know, it's a funny thing, Tex. You help save a man's life, and you don't feel like killing him anymore. Fact is, now that I've got to know you, I kind of like you. That's good news, Mike. After all, you're a Texan. And a friend. How about a Tex? It suits me. Suits me. Suits me, too. Well, King, I think we can safely say this case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Testing. One, two, three. Tasting. Tasting is the test. Pour out a heaping bowl full of delicious, crisp, Quaker-puffed wheat or Quaker-puffed rice. Top it with rich milk or cream and sweet, chilled fruit. Mmm, mmm, your mouth waters at the sight. Then take a big spoonful and, ah, what a taste delight. Those crisp king-sized kernels of Quaker puff wheat or rice are so deliciously tender, so nut-like in flavor, you want more and more. Taste them tomorrow morning for sure. Remember, they come only in those famous big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. He's your guarantee that you're getting the original crisp, fresh Quaker puff wheat and Quaker puff rice. Shot from guns. Remember, fellas and girls, the annual sale of Christmas seals is on. You know, the money paid for these Christmas seals helps four ways in the doctor's fight against tuberculosis. So check up on your family. See if they've bought all the Christmas seals they want. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the Black Bag. When I found a dying man on the trail to White Horse, I took him to an abandoned cabin and sent King into town for help. I didn't suspect that the man who came to treat a pistol wound would bring a black bag holding a time bomb to blow us all to destruction. And then things began to happen fast. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from gun. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast... Nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.